for joining us to help choose home when care is needed. A podcast all about the benefits and value of receiving care in a place you likely feel most comfortable, wherever you call home. I'm your host, Marilee Orsini, and I've been involved in health care at home since 1981. Each episode, I'll be talking with a guest who will help us in our quest to educate about health care at home. So let's get started on today's episode number 17. Our guest today is Matt Hansen. Matt has a doctorate in physical therapy, and he currently serves as general manager for Homespire. It's an intermountain health care company, and he is based in Utah. Matt has a passion for population health. He does, through his home care company, provide skilled life care management and also some personal services in the home. I first met him at the NAC, National Association for Home Care 2.0 Strategy Conference, and I will tell you his insights and his perspective were so impressive and interesting that I thought our audience would appreciate hearing from him. What is population health, your passion? Population health for me really means it's more preventative health. It's helping. One of the reasons why I fell in love with home care to begin with and home health was, for me, it provided the X factor, right? When working in a clinic, I would see uh, people come in and they'd leave and you kind of don't know what happens to them until I'm a physical therapist by background and we wouldn't see them again unless it was a couple months later and they'd be seeing us many times for the same thing or having experienced another fall or another injury. Um, by seeing them in their home, you were able to see what other factors were contributing to that, you know, kind of the lifestyle, safety issues, et cetera. So that really got me, uh, you know, excited about what can we do to prevent this cycle or what I refer to as the roller coaster of health care or roller coaster of sick care sometimes. Uh, what can we do to break it up? And, and I really believe that the answer begins at the root. It begins people um, need to first have an understanding of how their activities and their lifestyles impact uh, their health. And secondly, they have to be motivated to make a difference. So for me, population health is really reaching out to the community at large, and many times, and as I say at large, but many times it is on an individual basis, but reaching out at the root prior to its preventative care, its education. It's uh, stopping the, the roller coaster of, of sick care, uh, you know, at, at the top and doing what we can to smooth it out rather than waiting. We do a great job of patching things up. You know, something happens and someone, someone falls and breaks a hip. We do a great job of patching it up, but it's at an incredible cost to society economically but also to the individual. You um, have a home health company and you have a doctorate, right, in physical therapy. I do. I have a doctorate in physical therapy. The home health company is not my own. I had a staffing agency that was my own up in Washington State where I lived for eight years. Um, I work with, I'm the general manager for a company by the name of Homespire that's an Intermountain Healthcare company out in Utah. And as a home care provider, talk to me about how a consumer should be interested or could be interested in population health and how that translates into making a choice to to use home care if you have a care need. You know, historically, again, we put so much money and, and attention into acute reactionary care. I, I think that one of the reasons that we do that is because that's where the money goes. You know, government, regardless of what your political affiliations are, um, for the last several decades have been trying to figure out the health care crisis. And we, the solutions that we're getting are pretty much the same. I, I mean, there, there may be some differences, but we just keep putting more money into acute reactionary you know, care in response to crises. Uh, we wait until someone has the heart attack. Uh, we wait until somebody, again, breaks the hip or in, uh, until they have a congestive heart failure. Um, then we go into action. So as far as a consumer and, and being motivated, um, you know, it's, it's difficult because we, we've had a lot of public education campaigns, certainly, and, and some of them move the dial a little bit in healthy lifestyles and others do not. And many times it does take either that crisis to that first crisis for someone to have that kind of wake-up call. Um, I, I think that the best strategy that we have as care providers is that when we're seeing somebody for that first episode to really do a good job about education, but not only about education, about what they need to do in order to rehab or to recover, but what they can do to prevent uh, in, in the future as well. 
um, we have a unique in home care, we have a, a unique opportunity because we are in their home. You know, we can see the big bag of Doritos, we can see the two liter of Pepsi. Um, you know, and and we we know a little bit more about their their lifestyles. Um, and sometimes it takes a courageous conversation. We need to build that rapport with the person so they don't take offense as much as knowing that we're we're speaking to them out of sincerity and and care because we care about them. So I think we are in a unique position to be able to make a difference. The other side of things really comes from the payment model itself, and there are some organizations that are that are waking up um, to the fact that look, if we put a dollar in prevention, we can we, we can save a lot more in you know, down the line and, and in crises. And, you know, for years and years there have been a number of prophets out in the desert just kind of proclaiming these just wonderful ideas about preventative and you know, population health preventative care, but there haven't been systems willing to adopt them. And I think that there are now. There have even been some things very recently that have indicated EMCMS is, is waking up and what they, they've said, you know, certain programs that they have and value-based uh, programs as well as the fact that even home care, so private duty, is now going to have uh, Medicare Advantage plans are going to have the option of covering that begin January 1st, 2019. So I think there are some really good things happening. So if I have a spouse who needs care or, um, or a family member or a parent, um, what kinds of things as a consumer could I do to, to help my loved one um, not... I think. What did you say? Go down that path to uh, <laughs> to healthcare destruction or something? You had a great. What I refer to as kind of the roller coaster of the health of the healthcare crisis, right? The roller coaster that that we have these crises and it's the downslope, and then you patch back up, and you may not get to 100 percent again, but then something else occurs. Um, you know, we, I use the example of somebody, for example, my aunt, uh, my my mother's oldest sibling, um, never married, took care of my grandparents at home. She had a couple opportunities and feel that she found the right person to, to settle down with. And as she started to get older, she felt a duty, a responsibility to take care of her parents. So she stayed at home, at, you know, and, and carrying a full-time job, an extreme personal cost. But then after they passed on and she was still alone, then my mom became the caregiver for my aunt. And she had fractured a foot just stepping off the front step, came and stayed with my parents for, for quite a while. It was time to go back home. She went back home. And then she got a UTI. She had a urinary tract infection because she wasn't drinking very well, wasn't taking care of herself. She was feeling lonely now that she wasn't around family anymore. But she wasn't going to call my mom because my mom had just taken care of her for months. So my mom didn't know that anything was wrong. You know, she went out and visited or anything, and she put on a good face. But because of that, here she was, her first, you know, down the, down the roller coaster. She had fractured her foot. We got her back up, coming back up again. Now she has another incident with this UTI and didn't want to reach out because she felt like a burden ended up uh, going into the ICU for several months. They, they helped her. Uh, you know, she had developed sepsis. They, they helped her to get back on, on track, et cetera. Two days after she had been released and started in a skilled nursing facility, she passed away. Uh, she had had organ failure. And, you know, and that's a tragic case in, in our family's circumstances. But I think, you know, as far as helping other family, first and foremost, we have to recognize what our own limitations are because many times the caregiver themselves, we feel the duty. And I, you know, I think there is a duty there. However, we have to, it needs to be measured. Um, my mom, all those years that she helped to take care of my aunt as well as her parents when my aunt couldn't or when she was working, um, distracted time away from the rest of the family. And we never blamed her for it. We admired her for it. However, it still changed the dynamics in the family. And there are solutions now. You know, there's solutions for, for families to be able to get some additional support. So I think it's recognizing, first of all, what your own limitations are. And then secondly, as a family member, even having a frank conversation about how, that, how much that person means to them and saying, look, we're willing to do what we need to do for you. Sometimes, sometimes the person doesn't want to. They're afraid about leaving an inheritance. They're afraid about spending too much money. But that's money that they've earned. It's money that they've saved, if it has to be private duty. But there are a lot of benefits that are available also through through Medicare and, and other programs. And and just helping them to realize you're the most important thing in our life. And this is important that we you know take care of you at this point. Was there ever a time, um, I know that you say your aunt was hospitalized for, it sounds like, a considerable period of time. But was there a time when there was a choice about coming home with home care or going to a skilled nursing facility? 
in her circumstance, there wasn't, uh, simply because the physicians wouldn't release her home. Um, the physicians indicated that she needed 24-7 care. Uh, she was still getting infusions at the time. Uh, so, you know, this, this occurred about five years ago, and in the hospital system we were in, there wasn't. However, now there would be. I know a number, I know several organizations, I should say, not a majority, but several organizations that will work and with the physicians to even do home hospital. You know, it, it's amazing. We're bringing the hospitals home. The study by ARP has shown that 90%, you know, 9 out of 10 people want to stay at home as long as possible. And I believe it's over 80% of them think that the home that they're currently in is where they're going to be for the rest of their life. So people want to be home, and, and it's less costly to provide a lot of that care in the home. Um, you know, in a circumstance of this 24-7 care, it may not be, but still some people are willing to pay that difference just to be home. Well, and it sounds like, as you said, with Medicare Advantage payments starting to cover private duty services in 2019, um, it's probably still going to be less expensive to be at home, even with 24-hour care, than it would be to be in a hospital. It, it may be. It certainly, it, you know, it depends on the circumstances, but a, a survey that was put out recently, it's a yearly survey, and I believe it's put out by Genworth, uh, who's a long-term care provider. Um, but they they indicated on the, on the survey that for a semi-private room in a skilled nursing facility, the national average cost is $6,000. For a private room, it's even higher. And if somebody's in memory care, it can be higher than that. I mean, as much as $7,500. For an assisted living facility, it's about $5,000. And here in Utah, I know that private care, which surprised me that it was even this high, but it's still much less than other settings, was about $4,400 a month. Now, that you know, there are exceptions. Obviously, some people just need somebody to come in and, and do a bath and help them get dressed. But there's some new models that, that are happening that are even half the cost of that through using uh, care management in the house so by using skilled nurses who help to manage the care and to be that connection, to be that connected dot. In fact, the organization I'm working with is doing that. We call it life care management. And to be that dot that connects them with you know, the continuum of care, with the hospital, with their primary care physician, with their specialist, and making sure that they're helping that person to be engaged in their care plan at home also. Talk to me a little more about life care management because the... Um you know, I was a geriatric care manager for a couple of decades, and um, and this now is a concept that seems to be right at the forefront with the realization that not all people age the same way or even recuperate the same way. So someone who understands the system can help navigate through it. Is that what life care management is? It is. And, and in fact, you know, there are a number of different organizations from hospitals and health care networks to insurance companies who now have case managers. Um, the problem, at least in my opinion, is that many times those care, even though they're providing a significant service, they're checking in with the client or with the patient. They're checking in with them, seeing how they're doing. They may be using telemedicine, telehealth to monitor some things. But it's still, much of it occurs remotely. And they don't build that same relationship with the person. They're still missing that component oftentimes of what's in the home. And we're still siloed. We're, we're fragmented. Our healthcare system is fragmented. It used to be that a primary care physician was the, you know, our grandparents. They had a doctor in the community, and he knew everything about you. My my dad, you know, would would be stitched up. He got stitched up on his kitchen table. <laughs> you know, the doctor came over and he took care of him right there in, in in the home. And now we have specialists, and the specialists are fantastic at what they do, but it's very fragmented. We end up having to go through an entire health history every time that we go back in, and that's another soapbox of mine with. Universal EMR and, and, and some other concepts. However, we're fragmented. And the same thing I've found occurs many times with these with the other care managers is that they don't follow the person through every aspect of their life or at least don't have the same relationship. And, and maybe, maybe case managing, you know, 200, 500, up to 500 clients. And so the same relationship is in built. So even though I don't want to discount that, there's certainly value in that life care management is really building that relationship with the person in their home. So the model that, that, that we advocate for really treats the person more holistically. So we certainly are looking at health and wellness, and that's part of our life care plan, but we're also looking at other aspects, what we refer to as the seven elements of, of health and well-being, and working with other partners out in the community that can help to address those things also. Okay. So I think the, the key is, is, is one, getting to know people personally in their situations 
to keeping you know close tabs without and still giving them as much autonomy as possible. We want to step on toes. We don't want to step on the toes of other case managers. We want to complement that. But the third thing that's really important is just that continuum of care. You know, helping to make sure that it's as seamless as possible and that there's somebody in their life that that can help them to navigate you know all the questions that they have and the complications of the med management and and everything else. And that someone would, for most cases, be a family member or a neighbor. Many times it is, and sometimes it may be appropriate. But again, it comes at a, a tremendous burden. And and you know, with more and more options, we're we're trying to make, for example, the services we provide more universal. Also, we'd like everybody to be able to afford them. That's going to take working with the insurance companies and and uh, and with others to be able to change the payment model. And I really think that's what it's going to take. Our payment model needs to be more preventative. In Western medicine, we're not preventative. And we talk about it, but but we really aren't. We're reactionary, and and I think that's really what it's going to take. Um, but the family members and neighbors, we and you know even with what we do, we get them involved as much as possible. We don't want to take their place, but we want to support them and supplement them. You know, I wish that I had more time with my with my mom in in a different setting. She could still take care of, mom, of grandma and grandpa, but when you start bathing your your parents or grandma and grandpa. It changes the dynamic somewhat, and it may be uncomfortable for them as well. Um, now that we're not willing to, you know, just about anybody would be willing to do that for a parent. But if you had that hour, getting them ready, or two hours, getting them ready in the morning back, how would you spend it? Would you spend it more quality time with them? Maybe doing something they want to do, want to focusing on their on their passions and, and and hobbies, or recording a life story, or doing things like that instead. That paints a, a much nicer picture. Um, question for you. You said something about, was it seven pillars of wellness? Yeah, we do. The seven elements of well-being is what we refer to to the mass. Do you want to tell me what those are? Sure. <laughs> at, <laughs> at, at least for us. Now, it's interesting guess. that during conversations, you know, I, I hear people refer differently, but, but I think what is um, probably that there's some agreement on that most people and caregivers, when you really ask them about it, you say, okay, well, what is it that you address? Well, we address the ADLs or we address health and, and kind of wellness. Most of them will admit that's not really a holistic approach. You know, and so they, there may be a little bit of difference, and, and sometimes we title them differently or others will title them differently. But we, we look at them and we say health and wellness is one, home and safety is another. Um, we look at the person's uh, personal identity, uh, their, their social supports, their finances, their thinking and memory, and then their purpose and passion. So if you, you know, you could say, well, where does spirituality fall into that, for example? And we, we have that as part of identity. Um, you know, what's important to that person is important. And we really have to, now, does that mean that I'm going to go out and go through their finances with them? No. But I know people in the community who are trusted resources who can, and we're building those relationships. Um, you know, we may be able to help them to budget. If they want to go to assisted living facility, we can certainly help them to look at that and the financial impact on it. Uh, my favorite, it really is the purpose and passion because that's what motivates us. If somebody's not addressing their purpose and passion, then nothing else is going to fall into place, right? They're, they're not going to, why? Why would they be motivated to take care of themselves or to be what we refer to as compliant? I like the term engaged instead rather than compliant. Um, but to be engaged in, in their plan of cares from a doctor or from a home health agency or from wherever, whatever it may be. Um, so we look for ways to really, to, to reignite. We refer to it as the spark, to re-spark their lives, to look at, um, you know, maybe they like to paint and they'd always painted it. Now they have rheumatoid arthritis and just holding a, a, holding a paintbrush hurts. What can we do to adapt that? What can we do to help to, to get them, um, you know, involved in painting again if that's what they want to be doing. If they want to stay home and they don't want to go to an uh, assisted living facility or, or another setting, then what can we do to help to make that home more safe for them? You know, bringing in, you know, grab bars, a wheelchair ramp, uh, just helping them set up their home differently. So looking at it more holistically. Do you have um, an example or two of success stories that um, make you feel good every day? Oh, well, I do, certainly. We... Uh, now, with, with this particular company, with Homespire, we just started in uh, in May. It's a joint venture with Intermountain uh, Healthcare again, and, and the junior partner is uh, a company by the name of LifeSpark. 
It's L-I-F-E-S-P-R-K. They take the A out and they say that we drop the A because we take the A out of aging, which is, which is <laughs> unique. But they're based out of Minnesota. And uh, this particular life care model is a model that they have been working on um, for a number of years. And, um, you know, they have some great success stories. We're already experiencing some of our own even within a month. Uh, one of my favorites of theirs is, was regarding a, a, a man, a client that they had, uh, by the name of Vern, and Vern was staying in. He had a he had a degenerative condition and was staying in a skilled nursing facility. His physician had told him that he would never be able to go home, and it was at the cost of about seventy five hundred dollars a month. So you know the way that works, many people have saved up and they have their retirement, they have their fortune, et cetera. And in order to tap into benefits or Medicaid benefits, they have to spend down. It's referred to as spending down. So they just spend through their entire savings and fortune until they get to a point that the other benefits can kick in. And he had been there, and, you know, he was he was speaking to somebody else, to a, another provider, and they said, well, if anybody can help, it would be this other company. It would be LifeSpark. So LifeSpark went in and, and uh, did what they referred to as a discovery uh, with him, uh, rather than an assessment, which is very, you know, we're doing this to you, we're probing, et cetera. We refer to it as a discovery process and kind of learned what was important to him. More than anything, he wanted to go home. He didn't have any family around other than a brother who lived over in Wisconsin. And so they said, well, we can get you home. Initially, he needed 24-7 nursing, not only caregiving, but nursing. So as you can imagine, that was actually at home even a bit more expensive than his, than his, than his stay at the skilled nursing facility, but only for one month. Because during that month, they were able to, to look at what they could do to reduce the cost to tap into other resources that he had in his social support, one of those other elements, and and to be able to get some some more help in the home and then really start to work with him on improving his life. By doing that, they were able actually to reduce the need down to approximately $350 a month. Good. And he lived that way for a total of, I think it was another six years. I know it was seven years total, but another six years. And then during the last... Uh, just over six months of his life, he was able to come over onto hospice. So instead of 14 days on hospice, as is typical, you know, the average day, they were able to recognize when he was ready and be able to get that benefit in there so that he could benefit from it. His goal was he wanted to go back home and ride his John Deere lawnmower, and, and he did. You know, that's the way he was able to get back home and do that. And when it was time for hospice, he wanted to be closer to family, so they were able to, to move him to Wisconsin with his brother, and uh, he was able to pass there. What a wonderful, wonderful story. I've got another question because you piqued my interest talking about you are you have an ancillary business that does consulting but also product development. I'm wondering if that is also in the healthcare at home space. It, it is. So when my family and I, we moved back because of my parents' health. We moved from Washington, originally from Utah. I moved back to Utah. I refer to it as the Rocky Mountain Magnet. Pulls a lot of people home. <laughs> And uh, we moved back because my parents' health was failing. My mom had been diagnosed with breast cancer, and my father has a, a very unusual condition that we're hoping is not genetic. Um, but we, uh, you know, my wife and I had a young family, and we decided we really wanted to raise them around grandparents. So we moved back. Um, I had a staffing agency, and when we shut down the, you know, ran down our contracts, realized that Utah is a very different environment because it is very saturated in the healthcare environment that I probably wouldn't have as much, much success with the, uh, with the staffing agency here. So I had started to do some consulting when I was up in Washington. We expanded that and had some ideas that we wanted to work on. And one of them, um, the, the latest one, was uh, a, a home exercise program. So it's by the name of Freedom to Move, the Freedom and then the number two move. Uh, the website's freedomtomove.org. And what that is, primarily, I mean, the consulting is is in home care and hospice, and I've worked with a number of different groups uh, across the country on a number of issues. Um, but really, trying to, I like the, the difficult problems and working with those organizations that have a have a, a unique idea or want a unique idea and something that they can do to help to to, to fill a need. Um, but we've done a lot of QA things and things my partners have as well, and just helping you know agencies in that way. But this. Um, the video line that we did is, is really neat because it started with an article that I'd written and somebody asked if I could recommend a, a, a home exercise program for people who can't do the beach body type things. You know, the the, uh, the P90X and, and the abs of steel or whatever it might be. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, I said, 
that's a great question. Let me see what I can find out. And I, I told him, give me a couple of days, and I'll get back to you next week. Um, and I got back to the reader, and, and I said, you know what? The only other thing I'm able to find, it's a great program for a certain population, but it was the sit and be fit, mm -hmm. which is, you know, the for the geriatric population, they do the chair exercises. Mm -hmm. And they said, you know what? I, I feel I feel like a failure when I'm trying to do these other ones, or it wipes me it wipes me out. She had a immunological uh, disorder, but she said the sin be fit is just way too low for me. And is there nothing in between? And I said, you know, I couldn't find anything. She said, why don't you create something? So we did. So the the freedom to move is uh, an exercise program that can be adapted to anybody, regardless of what their uh, level is or their abilities. And and we started out with videos, and we've kind of taking it from there to, to classes and setting up programs in different areas. But um, it teaches the principles of exercise. You don't have to be running a half marathon or bench pressing your body weight to be exercising. That's a misconception that we have. The important thing is to keep on moving and do what you can with what you have. And is freedomtomove.org um, a place one could go buy products or test products to see if it might be helpful for their loved ones? It is on our website. We still do sell the the original uh, series, and we're we're also doing a lot of customized type programs for organizations. That's kind of the direction that we've moved now. But we still have we we still have a number of sales, quite a few sales, particularly um, through our partners uh, with different patient advocacy groups. But the the website itself does has the videos for sale, and there's a promo video there too, so people can kind of get a little snippet of what the videos are about. Well, as I said in my intro, um, talking with you gave me some insights and some ideas that I, I simply hadn't had before, and today has been no exception. So um, I really appreciate your time, and um, I really um, love what you're doing, and it is young people like you with new ideas that are um, going to help all of us who are right in the aging process <laughs> um, maintain a healthy lifestyle, hopefully. Well, thank you, Marilee. I, you know, it's it's something that we all need to work at for sure, and it's something that I'm I just love, as you mentioned, you know, passionate about that. I love uh, speaking to others who, you know, it starts with a desire. It starts with a desire to make a difference in whatever it is or whatever we feel our callings are in life. That starts with that desire, and then acting on them and, and finding like-minded people. Thank you so much for listening today, and a special thanks to our sponsors and partners, Access. National Association for Home Care and Hospice and Core Cubed. You can find more on our website, helpchoosehome.com, and on social media. Join us to spread the word and help choose home when care is needed.